Mario, my scientific training was in neuroscience as a way of understanding the brain, but my desire was really to use the brain as a vehicle to understand everything, because everything we know, we know through our brain, so maybe that's a, a shortcut to understand everything. I can't tell you I was very successful in understanding everything, but I, I, I learned. It's I learned not a shortcut. Thing. It's the only way that we know. <laughs> well, but I, I thought maybe there's there's more more there in terms of the the uh, the uh, the uh, ability to uh, by understanding the brain to understand the uh, uh, the things that the brain sees, which it, you really have to understand those things by themselves. Um, so what I've tried to do over the years is to kind of focus on what are the ultimate questions. Uh, now, if you talk to philosophers, talk to theologians, they have kind of answers. But I find it fascinating to talk to scientists about ultimate questions, about when they look at the cosmos, what are the, and everybody has a different approach to, to it. What I've seen that you've done uh, as, a, as a physicist and a cosmologist, you, you've taken a meta approach to, to kind of delve into the, the, the concept of, of human curiosity. So. Uh, what have you learned about human curiosity that can help us understand how people generate these kinds of ultimate questions? So human curiosity always fascinated me because I happen to be an incredibly curious person. And by that I mean that I'm interested in many things and not just in science, yeah. you know. I'm interested in art, I'm interested in music and, and so on. And I've always been extremely fascinated by people like Leonardo da Vinci, like Feynman. Not that I compare myself to yeah, them, yeah. but, you know, how could people be interested in so many things? So I became almost obsessed <laughs> with trying to find out what do we know about human curiosity? Because, you see, human curiosity, first of all, drives all the basic research that we do, of course. It drives the best works of art. It actually drives every conversation we have because yeah. if I bore you to tears, yeah. you're not going to sit and listen yeah. to me, right? It, you have to be a little bit curious yeah. about what I have to say. So I decided to look into this and I looked into many aspects of this, including, you know, what do psychologists, what are their latest experiments on curiosity? What do neuroscientists do? What, what they have done, because there are new tools, you know, they can use functional MRI of the brain. They make people curious and they look which parts of their yeah. brains are activated. So that's what I try to do in this book, which I call Why? with a question mark. Yeah. Good. So uh, what, what can we learn about uh, curiosity in terms of its deep structure? What, what drives us? Is there some um, evolutionary component of it that we had to be curious to be sure whether there was a leopard in the bush so the ones who were more curious if they, a leopard was there survived and procreated? So surely part, part is that, you know, it's for survival. You know, have to be curious not just if there is a leopard but, you know, how to best use your environment, how to best use your resources. You know, what can you do to improve your situation here and there and whatnot. So surely there is a strong evolutionary component. But what I also discovered was that these things that we call curiosity actually have different kinds. And the different kinds even activate different parts of our brain. So there is, for example, the curiosity we call well, not we call, uh, a psychologist, Daniel Berlin, called uh, perceptual curiosity. That's the curiosity we feel when we're surprised by something mm. on, or when we see something that's ambiguous. We cannot tell if it's this or that. On the other hand, there is the curiosity that he called epistemic curiosity. That's our love of knowledge. That's what drives scientific research. It turns out, believe it or not, that these two, two, two types of curiosities, they activate different parts of our brain. Mm. In one case, the perceptual curiosity, the one that we're surprised, is more a state where, and psychologists have dealt with this too, is it feels a little bit like we are deprived. You know, we feel that there is something there that we must know, mm. but, you know, we know a little bit, but we feel that there is more to be known. If, if you like, call this the known unknowns. <laughs> Namely, there are some things we know that they are unknown. Right. On the other hand, epistemic curiosity, the love of knowledge, uh, is not associated with an aversive state. It's actually associated with a state of anticipation of reward. Mm. We activate our reward system. Mm. We, it's a bit like wanting food, wanting <laughs> better sex, wanting better wine, things like that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so if we, if we look at uh, ultimate questions and we take your two kinds of, of uh, curiosity, let me give you an, a very uh, important uh, event in cosmology, your field. Uh, in the late 1990s, I think about 1998, it was discovered that the universe was, uh, we've known it's been expanding for almost 100 years, 75, I guess 100 years, close to 100 years now. Uh, but we assumed that gravity would make the expansion slower and slower, and 1998 or so we discovered that the expansion was getting getting uh, uh, faster, uh, faster, and, faster. And, and that was a, a, an ex nobody predicted that. The people who discovered it were looking for the opposite. So that kind of surprise certainly it drove the uh, the epistemic uh, curiosity because there wasn't knowledge, but did the the original discovery was that was that a, a, a an aversive feeling because it was so disruptive? Yes, in a way it was. Now, of course, we do have to remember that Einstein did introduce his cosmological constant in 1917, but it was for a long time sort of taken yeah, for you know was not was not particularly. He said it was his greatest blunder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not quite with those words, yeah. but he thought it was not good to have put it yeah. in. Uh, his greatest blunder, in fact, has been to take it out. Oh, yeah, right, because right, had he right. left it in, he could have predicted <laughs> yeah. that the expansion should be accelerated. And may have won another Nobel right. Prize. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so, yes. So I think the initial reaction was one of surprise and therefore the creation of an unpleasant <laughs> state. But then, of course, you know, people started delving into this and to study it, and mm -hmm. that's the epistemic curiosity, you know, mm -hmm. the wanting to understand the love of knowledge. I, I, I love looking at humanity and, and analyzing the, de the degree of the resources that we put into activities that don't have an immediate, seemingly an immediate physical benefit to our lives. And, of course, there's great political controversies about how much you allocate to basic science and basic research that that seemingly have no uh, no benefit. Some people say, well, there'll be a future benefit, but the reason scientists want to do that is not for that. Exactly right. Uh, the, one example that many people know is Michael Faraday, who is you know, one of the discoverers of all phenomena in, that have to do with electromagnetism. And as he was doing his experiment, story has it that somebody from the government came and asked him, what is this good for? And he said, I'll tell you honestly, I don't know what it's good for, but I'm sure that very often we will be able to collect taxes on this. <laughs> and so, and this is about electromagnetism. Imagine, yeah. imagine yeah. that, which we cannot live with, without, right, you know, right. today. So even that became very, very useful. Right. So the thought is that indeed every basic research eventually becomes useful, that, you, you know, that there is... Uh, I heard the phrase, there is applied research and there is not yet applied <laughs> research. Yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right, and, and that is that most scientists, not all, I mean, some people do things for applications, sure, but, yeah. but many scientists do their work not because maybe a hundred years from now there will be an application, but simply because they are curious and they want to know the answers.